delivering that message to us to today come join us here um, and uh, help me feel small at the end of the day. So anyway, well, uh, and uh, uh, this this uh, this uh, brother is uh, a mighty man of God, and uh, and he is uh, laying the foundations for a new church plant in Washington D.C. and uh, it's Shalom Community Church. And uh, so we, it's, it's one of the sister churches in our congregation. And so uh, uh, great to have you here. Let's pray together. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the way your blessings flow. And, uh, and, and, and so we receive from you this morning and receive from you through our brother, Pastor Jonathan, today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Bishop. Good morning and shalom. How are you all doing? All right, I had to make a little adjustment. I tell you what, when uh, there are baptisms taking place, when there are baptisms taking place, um, God is in the house. Yes. That's a sure sign of the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to stand for the hearing and the reading of God's word. If you would just, those of you who are able-bodied, if you could take a moment and stand with me. I'm not trying to turn this into a Catholic mass and over standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down, but just call it spiritual aerobics. And uh, while you're standing, before we go into this passage of scripture this morning, I want to say something to you that I would like to make very plain and I'd like to make very clear. It is way of reminder. And it's very important because it has everything to do with your salvation if you so know the Lord Jesus as your Savior from sin. And the statement I'd like to make is this. Two things. First thing is God, the one and true living God, your creator, whom you are made in his image, loves you now more than he'll ever love you. God loves you now more than he'll ever love you. Now, some of you may struggle with that statement. You may feel like there's some things that you got to do. You may think there's some spiritual hoops or some exercises you have to go through because the scripture does teach work out your salvation in fear and trembling. But there's nothing you can do to purchase your salvation. God's mind is made up about you. He loves you. And he wants you to be reminded of that. Now, having said that, it gets to the next point. And that is this. Moments from now, God's invitation will be extended to you and extended to me. Just moments from now, God's invitation will be extended to you and extended to me, and it's an opportunity for us to be consumed by this ancient Hebrew concept, this peace of God, this shalom of God. So may the Holy Spirit prepare our hearts and minds as we get ready to go into this. Now I'd like to read this passage of scripture with you, and then I'd like to pray with you and pray for you, and then, perhaps, you will have a chance to sit down. How about that? <laughs> okay. I know Sister Akia, she don't need a microphone, so I'm hoping that she really helps us out here. And uh, I want us to read this passage of Scripture together, starting at verse 24. It reads this way. It says, May Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh look with favor on you and give you peace. Verse 27, in this way that you will pronounce my name over the Israelites and I will bless them. Hallelujah for the word of God. Let me pray with you and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for the celebration of life. We thank you that we've been able to enter into praise and worship and express ourselves to you. And as we were reminded by Pastor Kia this morning that true worship of the Lord worships the Lord in spirit and in truth. God, it is in this truth, the truth of your son Jesus and what he has done for us that we come to you. And even as we come to you, we think of those who could not be with us those who are sick and shut in, we think of loved ones, we think of those who perhaps are too ill to be here, and we pray for them, and we ask that your spirit visit them, and assure them, and reassure them, and touch them in their bodies, Lord God. 
Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to look to your word, to look to your truth. And may our hearts and mind be in attention. And may we respond to the conviction and love of your Holy Spirit. I pray this way in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for reading that passage of scripture with me. And usually in a sermon, the teacher or preacher or the pastor or evangelist, they like to build up to the big takeaway, but I'm going to give that to you right now. <laughs> you know, this uh, passage of scripture and numbers is such a comprehensive passage of scripture, and God does some special things here. So what I want to do in just a moment is I'm going to give you a historical and theological overview of the book of Numbers and lead us right into chapter 6 where this shalom of God, this ancient Hebrew concept of the peace of God comes out. But as I go into it, the big takeaway of this, the big takeaway from this message should be and would be and will be is that the peace of God in God's economy, peace, true peace comes at a cost. In God's economy, peace, lasting, true peace, comes at a cost. And this is where the Holy Spirit has to work in our hearts and our mind for us to understand this. You know, the book of Judges has a, a wonderful, obscure verse that I haven't heard anybody really concentrated on uh, in, 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 in the sense of preaching and teaching. But it's when this warrior Gideon was called by God and he was called to do this wonderful work as, as to represent God's people in, in a combative sense. After this struggle of God humiliating Gideon and God humbling him and God bringing him to a place where the numbers were right, this, right in this theme of numbers like Bishop is sharing, like he's talking about in this theme of numbers, when the numbers are right, God uses them and they have a great victory, but this is what Gideon does. And this sets us up for this little historical and theological overview that I want to go over in the book of Numbers here. And Gideon, I'm pardon me, in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, it says, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it Yahweh Shalom. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it Yahweh Shalom. There was peace that was established for God's people. And the majesty of Messiah and the majesty of God and the presence of God was there and the power of God was there, but it was at a cost. A battle had to take place. And you and I, we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. And the cost for my peace and the cost for your peace and the cost for my salvation and the cost for your salvation was the life of Christ. And that's why this message, this priestly blessing is so appropriate, it's so wonderful, particularly during this time of the holiday season. So let me read to you a few things in this overview. Then I want to just go into the opening of Numbers chapter one and read a few verses there. And after that, as we go into chapter six where this priestly blessing is, I want to share four, three thoughts with you about the shalom of God. Three thoughts with you about the shalom of God. And then I will share eight thoughts with you concerning the blood of Jesus that I hope you never forget. I will share eight thoughts with you concerning the blood of Jesus that I hope you never forget. The book of Numbers chronicles the experience of two generations of the nation of Israel. The first generation participated in the exodus from Egypt. Now their story begins in Exodus chapter two, verse 23. And it continues throughout Leviticus and to the first 14 chapters of the book of Numbers, which is why I'm starting here, because it covers this thing. And we're right there in the middle of that in chapter 6. This generation was numbered for war as God prepared them for a conquest into Canaan, which we know as the promised land. And... However, the people arrived to the southern edge of Canaan and they refused to go into the land. And that's in further in Numbers in Numbers chapter 14. Because of their rebellion against the Lord, all of the adults ages 20 and over, except for Caleb and Joshua, were sentenced to die in the wilderness. It's a bad deal. In chapters 15 through 25, the first and second generation, they overlap. 
And then a second numbering was taking place as the first generation that came out of the slavery in Egypt was dying off, and this new second generation came of age, God took a second census, a second numbering. These Israelites, they did go to war. It's recorded in chapter 26 of Numbers, and they did inherit the land, as well as in chapter 26. And the story of the second generation, beginning in Numbers 26, continues throughout the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua. Now, having said that, I want to read the first five verses of Numbers chapter 1, and this is going to set us up going into 2, 3, 4, 5, and then pow, in chapter 6, out jumps this wonderful majesty because God does something very important with his people. You see, what God is doing as we go into this is God is organizing his people. He's taking these slaves who were not a people, who were nobody, who outnumbered their masters, and he's giving them an identity. He's giving them his identity. Now, this ragtag bunch has been wandering around in the wilderness, and ironically enough, if you look at the Hebrew for the name of the book of Numbers, some commentators it says in the wilderness, other commentators say it's, and he spoke. I like to combine the two, and he spoke in the wilderness. Okay. Sounds good to me. Yeah. But my point is, God begins to step in and he begins to organize his people. Well, now he's going to teach them how to have what I call gospel-worthy living. He's going to teach them how to be believers and represent him on earth. Yeah. And it starts right here in this census that is being taken in Numbers. Now I want to read to you Numbers chapter 1 and then we're going to jump ahead and go to chapter 6 as I do a little bit of a sandwich and have just a little bit of overview of 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. Numbers chapter 1 verse 5, I mean pardon me, verses 1 through 5 reads this way from the translation I hope before me. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. That's very important. They're out of Egypt. They're not slaves anymore. They're free. Mm -hmm. So God says, take a census of the entire Israelite community by their clans and their ancestral houses, counting the names of every male one by one. That's important. What are we doing here? What are you celebrating here at CCF? These numbers are not just a theme and something cool. These numbers mean something. Yeah. People have been baptized. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People have joined in and said, you know what? I want to be a member. I want to be a partner. I want to be a part of what God is doing here. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then it falls over and it extends out into the community. And you all are reaching out. Numbers. Very important goes on to say, you and Aaron are to register those who are 20 years of age or more by their military divisions. God is organizing his people. Everyone can serve in Israel's army. Everyone who can serve in Israel's army, pardon me. A man from each tribe to be with you, each one the head of his ancestral house, very important. These are the names who are to assist you. And then it goes into chapter one, two, three, four, five, six. And so what happens is in chapter one, you have an instruction. You get the instruction that we just read and then there's tribes and leaders that are recorded in the census. It goes on into chapter two, tribes and leaders. That's why when we started out, I had this kind of busy slide that had all of these names and so forth. Goes on in chapter three, the sons of Aaron and special instructions for the Levites and the priests. And it's very, very important. Goes on in chapter 4, census of the Levites, and then uh, uh, dealing with a specific tribe, a certain type of priest, a certain type of Levite that you really don't hear much about. And then in chapter 5, it gets interesting. Chapter 5 gets into what I would call confessions and restrictions. Ooh, well, that's old time religion. I don't want to talk about that stuff. Well, it's there, and it's in the Bible and I just can't stumble over it. It's very important, at least to the heart of where God wants to take us. So we get into restrictions and confessions, but it's really dealt with uncleanness because God is trying to establish his name in the earth and he's using the Israelite people because the Old Testament and New Testament can be thought of in some simple ways. A simple way the Old Testament can be thought of is God reveals himself through the priest. God reveals himself through the prophets, and God reveals himself to the kings. 
God in Old Testament reveals himself through the priests. He reveals himself through the prophets, and he reveals himself to the kings, through the kings. Now, there's a 500-year gap that takes place, and along comes Messiah. After his immaculate conception, and after these, what we call silent years, the Lord Jesus is developing, and then he comes out into his ministry, and he goes, repent, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he starts to provide healing and do miracles and call people to himself and turn the world upside down because Jesus is prophet of all prophets, priest of all priests, and king of all kings. So you have this prophet, priest, and king, these divisions that we learn about God in Old Testament, embodied in the Lord Jesus. The scriptures teach in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hallelujah for Jesus. So in chapter Six, all of a sudden, pops the Nazarite vow. Where did that come from? It's dealing with numbers. It's talking about the ancestral houses. It's getting God's people organized. And then they get into a few rooms. And it's dealing with uncleanness. We don't like that. It makes us nervous because that means I got to deal with my sin. And then, all of a sudden, the Nazarite vow pops up. It's the Christology that's sown throughout the scriptures. God is preparing hearts and minds for the coming of Messiah. For that Savior who is to come. And this Nazarite vow, interesting enough, is how chapter 6 opens up and it's dealing with holiness. And then this beautiful priestly blessing. I want to read the priestly blessing again that we read when we opened up. And then I want to share briefly with you as we prepare for God's invitation, three things about the shalom of God and eight things about the blood of Jesus. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. May Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, his people. May Yahweh look with favor on you and give you peace, the peace that you need. And this way they will pronounce my name, the Lord says, over the Israelites. And he says, I will bless them. I mentioned there's three things that I wanted to mention about the peace of God, the shalom of God. And I already gave you my big takeaway, which is the peace of God, lasting peace, comes at a price. And it's one that you cannot afford to pay. I don't have it like that, and you don't have it like that. <laughs> the scriptures say a lot of things about how God works in our life. We see it here as the children of Israel are blessed. And one of the things that I have to ask myself, and one of the things you have to ask yourself when you go in the Bible, is what does it say? What does it mean? What is God saying to me? That first reading, what does it say? That second reading, what does it mean? Looking more at the passage. And then that third reading, what is God saying to me? And the New Testament is full of the same type of blessing. It says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because God, through his Holy Spirit, has taken his signet ring and put it on your soul once you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are owned and bought and paid for with a price. There are so many wonderful passages of scripture that's dealing with this in the New Testament. For God works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. This is the blessing. And so the three things about the shalom of God is this. Number one, the peace of God, a shalom of God, starts with you and God having peace with God. And this is that costly peace that I'm talking about, the peace that I can't afford, the peace that you can afford. In order to have peace with God, there is a price that has to be paid. And God, out of his mercy, provides it. We're going to come to that. The second thing is God, the shalom of God, this ancient Hebrew concept of peace is God wants his peace to abide in you, for you to be fulfilled and be a peaceful person. Your vertical is right. You have a, a peace with God, your creator. That's important. And then you have a peace within. A lot of people can't look in a mirror. 
because of their struggle with this, because of their shame, or because of their disappointment, or because of their abuse, or whatever this world has done to you, and how people are so hard on one another. And God wants to give you a divine peace where his spirit rests in you. That's why we're, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's peace with God, your vertical, peace within, and then there's peace without. You see, the world starts there. The world starts where we go on and on and on with, with this type of peace. And we think if we can accomplish peace with our fellow men, then we can sleep at night. And we won't have to go to the counselor. We won't have to go to the psychologist. We won't have to go to the therapist because, oh, look at me. I did something real good. I gave a person peace. And it's so backwards and it's so wrong and it doesn't work. Peace with God, your vertical, peace within, because of the Holy Spirit abiding in you. Yes. Once you come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then peace without, peace with others. Yes. Three things about the shalom of God. Real quickly, eight things about the blood of Jesus that I hope you never forget. Put on your Bible seatbelt because I'm about to go really, really quickly here. First of all, you and I need to understand that that price that had to be paid was the very life of the Lord Jesus, and it was his blood. And I am concerned as a pastor these days, I am concerned as a preacher these days, because I can talk about marriage and family, and it's popular preaching. I can talk about raising successful kids, and it's popular preaching. I can talk about how to be a successful businessman, a businesswoman, and it's popular preaching. But when we get into things of the cross and the blood, oh, that's old time of religion. Let's not do that. We don't want to talk about that. Doesn't feel the pews. And there is a demonic doctrine that has crept into in the United States and the continental U.S. slowly crept into where we're preaching a bloodless gospel. But I want to share with you eight things about the blood of Jesus that I hope you never forget. Thing number one. Hold on. Here we go. It is the blood of propitiation. It is the blood of propitiation. Romans 3.25 says this. God presented him as our propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because he has shown restraint and has passed over previous sins committed. Here's the mercy of God. Here's the mercy seat of God. What happens is Jesus hung on that cross that our sin was impudiated to him and his righteousness was translated to us. It's the mercy of God. It is the blood of propitiation, Romans 3.25. It is not only the blood of propitiation, it is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of redemption. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 says this. You, speaking of the Lord Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed your people for by your blood, from every nation, every tribe, and every people, and every nation are saved. Revelation 5, 9. It is the blood of propitiation, God's mercy. It is the blood of redemption. It is also, number three, the blood of remission. Hebrews 9, chapter 22. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Costly. Cost Jesus his life. It is the blood of propitiation. It is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of remission. It is the blood also of reconciliation. Number four, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you were far off and have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. Hallelujah for the blood. Number five, it is not only the blood of propitiation. It is not only the blood of redemption. It is not only the blood of remission. It is not only the blood of... It is the blood of reconciliation. Pardon me, thank you. Number four is the blood of reconciliation. But in Christ Jesus, you were afar off and brought near by his blood. Number five, it is the blood of justification. It is the blood of justification. Romans chapter five, verse nine. Much more than since we have now been declared righteous by his blood. Do you see the thing there in the New Testament? We will be saved through him from wrath. Much more than since we have been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. You know, it's very interesting when you and I stand before Jesus on that great and terrible day. 
whether we are raptured up or as the Lord Jesus in a mere return, if we happen to close our eyes and we die, the scriptures teach us appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And we look at this and we cringe, we really should celebrate. Because I'm telling you right now, it's nothing like we're going to think. We often get God to come be wrong on how he does things. But I tell you, when you stand before God, it will be safe, Akia. And there will be applause, and there will be a celebration. It will be safe, Glenn. And there will be applause, and there will be a celebration. It will be safe, faith. And there will be applause, and there will be a celebration. It will be safe, Jonathan. And there will be applause, and there will be a celebration. Because Jesus gave his blood. We are bought and paid for with a price. It is the blood of propitiation. It is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of remission. It is the blood of reconciliation. It is the blood of justification. I am justified and you are justified before God because of his blood. But here's my favorite, number six. It is the blood of peace. My favorite thing about the Lord Jesus is not only that he is the king of all kings and he is the Lord of all lords, but he is the prince of all peace. Praise God for the peace of God, for the shalom of God, the peace that the Lord Jesus can give. And the scripture says this, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Hallelujah for the peace that God can give. Number seven, it is the blood of entrance. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 19 reads this way. Now, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary, because once again, here comes his saints, and we enter through his blood. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through his blood and the blood of Jesus. And number eight, it is the blood that cleanses. It is the blood that cleanses. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says this. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Yeah. It is the blood of propitiation. It is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of remission. It is the blood of reconciliation. It is the blood of justification. It is the blood of peace. It is the blood of entrance, and it's the blood that cleanses us from all sin. Amen. As the musicians make their way up here, I want to read something that you might find interesting. I know that I did. J.P. Morgan, his will contains 10,000 words. And in his will, he made a very powerful declaration that he wrote into his will for his children. Now you gotta think about this man, he made many financial transactions, some of which affected the financial equilibrium of the entire world at the time. But he wrote this in his will for his children. He says, I commit my soul into the hands of my savior, full of confidence that having redeemed me and washed me with his most precious blood, he will present me faultless before the throne of my heavenly father. I entreat my children to maintain and defend at all hazard and at all cost and at all personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of complete atonement of sin through the blood of Jesus once offered and that alone. J.P. Morgan was right. The peace that God wants you and I to understand, that priestly blessing that he's made available for us is in his economy very costly. The scriptures teach about the blood, that the life is in the blood. So you might be asking, why the blood? Why the blood, Pastor? Because the life of all flesh is in the blood. In other words, my peace, my salvation, your peace, your salvation, cost Jesus his very, very life. I would, as we prepare for the communion, I would ask you, if you are struggling with true peace, and if you are, will you come at the altar and confess this to God and allow him to encourage you, allow him to fill you 
allow him to demonstrate his love to you once more. If you know the Lord Jesus has saved you from sin, you may have other needs that are taking place. You may have need for healing. You may be struggling with things that you haven't been able to put into words. And you feel the conviction to perhaps come forth and have prayer and have assistance. And I would even go on to say, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior from sin, what a time, what a time to give your life to Christ. As he says, I want to bless you and I want to keep you. And my mind is made up. I bought and paid you with my life says Jesus. I'm going to ask those of you who feel the need to come forth and while we're making that transition, I'll say a brief prayer. Father, we thank you for the peace of God that 